Hi, my name is Patrick von Schlag. I'm really pleased to be the instructor for your Idle 2011 orientation program. My background in IT goes back about 25 years, managing technical support organizations for companies who do pharmaceuticals, companies in the electricity business, managed some shrink wrap software companies for a number of years, and have actually worked in IT and business management organizations in training and consultancy organizations for most of the last 20 years had a lot of opportunity to work with some very big organizations, some very small organizations, and how we do a better job of understanding customer requirements, delivering effective services that are going to enable them to be more successful. And that really brought me back to IT service management, which I really began working with way back in the 1980s when it was first being postulated. And so the IDLE really helps provide benefits to more organizations because it works. It's written by people like you and me who have jobs to do and reflects real practices that regular organizations like ours use every single day to get work done more efficiently, more effectively, and to deliver better value for our customers. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to work with you, to introduce you to IT service management, to the idle books, and to some of the cool opportunities that are waiting for you. I look forward to the program and having you with us, and obviously look forward and hope you'll be interested in learning more about idle and IT service management. Hi, and welcome to the idle 2011 orientation and awareness program. In this course, we're going to talk about what idle is, what IT service management is, how the IT service lifecycle supports delivering better services for customers, facilitates our ability as a service provider to gain efficiencies and become more effective, and ultimately to improve the overall ability of our organizations to create value over time. We're going to talk about service strategy and its role in helping us assess particular options and make good decisions given imperfect information about where and how we're going to make investments in services. We're going to talk about service design and its role in understanding customer requirements and helping us to build, buy, and integrate various components of services to deliver the outcomes that customers want. We'll talk about service transition and its role in helping to take new services and changes out of development environments through testing and validation and effectively into the live production environment. We'll talk about service operation and its role in delivering and supporting services in production, proactively preventing disruptions, and managing incidents and problems when they do occur to be able to minimize impact on customers. Lastly, we're going to talk about continual improvement and the role continual improvement plays in driving iterative improvements to our processes, to our services in a way that's going to help us deliver more value, more efficiencies over time. I'm really glad that you've taken the opportunity to be part of our program. I look forward to working with you and teaching you a little bit about IDLE 2011. Welcome to the IDLE 2011 orientation. In this portion of the program, we're going to talk a little bit about the service life cycle and the role that the service life cycle plays in supporting an IT organization. There are a number of course sections that we're going to go through together in this orientation course. We're going to talk about service management and the role that service management plays in supporting outcomes for customers. We're going to talk about the IDLE books and how the IDLE books support service management practices and provide you guidance on how to use good processes, functions, roles to go carry out service management activities. We'll introduce you to the five parts of the IT service management service lifecycle. Service strategy, service design, service transition, service operations, and continual service improvement. And then bring these ideas together for you and provide a place for you to go if you want to ask additional questions. In this lesson, we're going to introduce the broad ideas of IT service management and how IT service management supports customer needs, goals, and objectives. When you look at the total cost of ownership of delivering IT services to support customers, a lot of the money that gets spent actually gets spent doing routine work managing services in operations, and only 30% of the budgets really are being driven into new capabilities. Done correctly, we can use practices like IT service management 
to be able to reduce the amount of money that's spent just maintaining existing capacities and capabilities and to be able to reinvest the rest in being able to drive improved capabilities and quality of service and ultimately to deliver better quality and better value for our customers. So if you look at analysts like IDC, over a five-year period, 60% of our total cost of ownership are being spent on manual tasks to maintain service delivery. That's an unbelievable amount of money doing routine work. And what we really want to be able to do is to reinvest that, some of that money in a way that's going to deliver better value for customers. When you look at what Gartner has identified, looking at service management practice frameworks can actually help you save as much as 48% in your annual total cost of ownership, that's money that you can reinvest in things that are going to deliver higher value. So if you want to think about this in more broad terms, in many organizations, as much as 70% of the money is going to operations, and as much as 70% of that is going to firefighting, to basic incident management and incident response. So if you look at that you know, in its broadest context, fully half the budget is being consumed by reactive firefighting and cleanup. So what would it mean if we could use good practices and processes to liberate a third of that resource? And how could we invest that money in a way that would drive better value for the organization? That's what service management at its most basic is all about, optimizing the cost and value that we create for customers so that we can create more value and be able to do that in ways that are more cost effective. So when you look at the value to the business associated with service management holistically, it's really about making sure that information technology organizations focus less on the technology and more on the services and outcomes that it supports for our customers. So service delivery environments that are successful now are focused around customers and customer outcomes. What services do we provision and deliver that are going to deliver the right level of capability, the right level of cost, the right level of compliance with state and regulatory requirement capabilities, and to be able to do this in a way that hopefully liberates resources to go do things that are higher value. So if you look at ROI on service management initiatives, companies like the Hacker Group have found that doing good best practices activity for every million dollar or billion dollars in revenue that your organization has, you're able to drive out somewhere between two and five million dollars in actual costs that are not in fact delivering additional value for your client. So when you look at IT service management as a set of practices, it enables us to effectively design, implement, and operate services in a way that enables us to align what we're doing with the outcomes that our customers are looking for from us and to be able to use continual improvement programs to be able to drive ongoing improvements in the services we offer, the processes we utilize, and our ability to maintain governance and control over our IT organizations. The primary domains of IT service management include frameworks like COBIT for governance, IDLE for service management, PMI or PRINCE2 for project management, Lean or Six Sigma for quality improvement activities, and things like ISO 27002 for security management. Let's take a look at each one of those domains briefly. Some of the key things you need to be thinking about in terms of service management initiatives are some of the critical success factors that it takes to actually get benefit and results from this what we tend to call critical success factors. The critical success factors for IT service management initiatives begin with strong executive leadership. We want to have an approach that looks holistically and an organization-wide approach to doing service management, to actually focusing not on delivering technologies or delivering applications or delivering infrastructure, but delivering services, delivering sets of services end-to-end -end that support and deliver appropriate outcomes. Other key critical success factors, we need to have some basic maturity assessment of our existing environment. What are the current processes and practices that we have? What's the relative capability associated with those? How are we using things like continual improvement programs to improve the quality of our services and processes? Do we have clearly defined roles and responsibilities with unambiguous accountability and authority for people to be able to perform work appropriately? Do we have clarity around the process purposes, goals, and objectives, and are those effectively aligned to broader sets of organizational goals and objectives? And are we, in fact, using good metrics, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely, or what we tend to call smart targets associated with the services that we provision and deliver? 
So what we want to be able to think about here is if I want service management to be successful, if I want to be able to achieve savings, if I want to be able to deliver better services to customers, we have to get consistent in the approaches that we use in terms of the processes we use and the services we deliver. There are a number of need-to-know concepts that we're going to use over and over again in this course, and we're going to talk about them in some detail now. We're going to talk about IT service provider models and the different aspects and frameworks, models, and quality systems we might use to support service provider frameworks. Talk about the notion of a good practice, what we mean when we say things like service and service management. Talk a little bit about service models, functions, processes, roles. What exactly do we mean when we use those terms? And then we'll talk about some of the core service management domains and how various processes and tools underpin and support those activities. If you think of yourself as a services provider, eventually we have to think in terms of the services and outcomes that we deliver. Which customers consuming which services to be able to support which particular sets of business needs. In order to be able to manage any service provider organization, we're going to have to put in place certain types of frameworks, models, standards, and quality systems that are going to help us operate our organization, be able to effectively do strategic planning, design, facilitate project development, drive service improvements, maintain security postures, and so forth. And so what we're going to talk about in this section is really looking at different aspects of capabilities for any particular service provider. Our ability to create and manage services across a life cycle, our ability to drive improvements to our capabilities, and the scope of services that we can effectively deliver to support customer needs. So if you take a look at the domain map here, it, there's a lot of things going on on this slide, but the things that you really want to be focused on are that in order to be able to effectively deliver good services to customers, a couple key things have to occur. The first one is, I have to have meaningful alignment between what the enterprise or customer is looking for from us and what we actually deliver. So we want to be able to put in place frameworks like COVID or ISO 38500 in a way that are going to help us maintain proper governance between what the company or the organization is looking to do and then what we're looking to do as IT service management providers. Within the service provider itself, I need to be able to manage the flow of strategic planning, design, transition, operations, and improvement of my services. How do we, in fact, as an organization, provision and deliver services in support of those goals and objectives? And then we want to be able to think about other practices we can use to underpin and support those. Good project management methodologies like the PMBOK or PRINCE2. Good quality management methodologies like Lean or Six Sigma security management methodologies and information security management systems that essentially allow me to bake security into all of the practices that we follow. And then various capability models that will enable us to effectively understand our current level of capability in doing each of these things and be able to drive improvements against those. Eventually, of course, what we want to be able to do is to take the various resources we have at our disposal, our hardware, our software, our budgets, our people, and so forth, and apply them in a way that optimizes the benefit of all of this. The first aspect of establishing a service provider model is to establish appropriate governance and oversight over the IT organization. And again, that cannot be an IT-only thing. We want to be able to utilize appropriate governance to work first from the organizational's governance strategy, organizational rules, policies, and boundaries, and to be able to make sure that our IT service provisioning is in proper alignment with that. So when we use frameworks like COBIT, essentially what we're trying to do is effectively create governance structures for how we plan and organize services, how we acquire and implement components to make services effectively deployed in production, to be able to deliver and support those services, and then to be able to effectively monitor and evaluate the performance of those services and use that to drive improvement activities. The next of the key aspects, and the one that we're going to spend the lion's share of our time on in this particular course, is the IT Infrastructure Library and how the IT Infrastructure Library, or IDLE, helps us manage services through a life cycle how we do strategic planning, how we understand customer requirements for services and design, build, buy, integrate the right components to go deliver that, how we manage transitions of service out of development and into production, 
how we do operational support of services in the production space, and how we do continual improvement against our various processes and services. Another of the key aspects of effective management within a service provider is the ability to exercise on projects and programs. And so, as is the case in many other areas, there are very good practices available today around project management from disciplines like the PMBOK, PRINCE2, and that provide specific structures in how we go about the process of forming, structuring, initiating, planning, and executing projects to design and implement services. And so in many cases, as we start talking about things like service management, it's not a question of should we focus on service management or should we focus on project management. You're going to use good project management disciplines to execute projects to support service creation and provision. One of the other things that you're certainly going to want as part of your overall service provider approach is a way to specifically drive quality management and improvement. There are many, many different quality management systems, all of which have relative merit to them, from the Deming cycle to Duran and Crosby to from Lean and Six Sigma and others. In this particular example, Six Sigma enables us to effectively define, measure, analyze, improve, and control how we provision and deliver different aspects of services, how we measure and report on the performance of those services, and how we use those metrics and analysis capabilities to identify and drive improvements to our processes and services. So IDLE will talk a lot about using continual service improvement practices, but Six Sigma may be a particular tool that we might use to execute and do statistical analysis and look for improvement opportunities. When you start looking at implementing information security management systems in your organization, one of the tools that you may use at your disposal is an ISO standard called ISO 27002, which effectively describes a security management system for an organization. How you do management overall, how you manage the implementation of services and support of security in integrated ways throughout your processes, throughout your services, and to be able to do that in a way that's continually driving ongoing analysis, monitoring, evaluation, and improvement of your security posture. Taken together, what these various frameworks, models, and quality systems give us is the ability to create a broader capability model for us as a service provider organization overall. And this really has three broad aspects that we want to consider. The first of these is what we might think of as the capability of our practice. What services can we deliver to customers and ultimately which customers can we su support with which particular baskets of solutions. The second key part of this is what we might think of as the quality of our practice. How exactly do we produce services that create value for customers. This may involve the, our ability to design them, our ability to transition and manage them in environments, our ability to drive improvements to them, and our ability just to manage customer relationships. The third key piece is quality of service. How well do we do these other things and what can we do within a continual service improvement framework to drive iterative improvements to our practices and to the overall basket of capabilities we can bring to support different customer sets. So the goal here, if you're managing your service provider organization, is to use frameworks, models, and quality systems to produce capabilities, to produce particular services that support particular customers, to be able to do that in a way that drives improvement against them, and to be able to use good, consistent processes and approaches so that we can provision and deliver services reliably this week, next week, next month, next year, and so forth. So when you consider how your service provider model actually plays out, it's reasonably straightforward. You have customer organizations, whether you're an internal or an external service provider, who have goals and objectives they want to meet. The organizations that you're supporting have their mission, their vision, their goals and objectives. In order to be able to carry out their organizational goals, they use processes of various kinds. Processes to support sales activity, marketing, operations, and so forth. And so most of those processes, and in fact, if you think about most business organizations, you can hardly even think of any processes anymore that aren't in some way underpinned and supported by IT. So they're counting on various IT services to facilitate and enable those processes to work better, 
faster or more cost effectively than they might want to otherwise. And so our objective as a service provider is to deliver the right basket of services to enable those. Some of those we might do, some of those we might bring in external resources to do. But of course, from the customer's perspective, it's all IT to them, and they're looking to be able to do their jobs. So then our job is to figure out how to do the appropriate alignment, what things we're going to do internally, how we're going to manage contracting with third parties, and what's our sourcing strategy is going to be to actually deliver those services to the customer. And then there are other frameworks like ESCM that we might be able to use for managing those external customer relationships and ensuring that we have both the broad sourcing strategy right and then the specific things that we want to have in place to do appropriate vendor management. So when we were introducing terms at the beginning of this section, we mentioned this notion of a good practice. And I, for one, really struggle with the whole idea of a best practice anyway because, of course, the implication there is that it's a practice that you could never improve, and I've never seen one of those. So the whole idea of a good practice is that there are certain practices that are simply better than others because lots of people have used them over a long period of time. They're efficient in how they act. They execute effectively and consistently and repeatedly, and they do what they're supposed to do. They help us get the results that we want, and we've been able to do that over and over again over a long period of time. So when we start looking at these frameworks, models, and quality systems, and then the specific processes and roles and structures that they recommend, part of the thing to remember is that we're specifically talking about frameworks that have been largely beaten to death over many, many, many years. They've been used over and over and over again in a lot of different organizations. And the things that make them good are that they've been used and shown to work effectively across a very broad array of different customer environments, from very big companies to very small companies, from companies in different verticals, public sector and private sector organizations, and so forth. And so when we talk about IT service management and the practices that are documented in the idle books, what we're really effectively saying is that these are practices that are widely used by large arrays of organizations to get results, to be able to do things efficiently and effectively. So when we look at the definition of things like service management holistically, it begins with the idea that I want to be able to deliver value to customers. And I want to be able to do that in a way that allows them to function more efficiently and more effectively, and that they're going to be able to have a reliable enough and and capable enough service that they can effectively count on that service to be able to perform their business tasks. And we obviously, as a service provider, want to be able to have sufficient organizational capabilities to be able to provision that value to them. So that's largely about how we organize ourselves, how we use process, how we manage our teams, how we take advantage of knowledge and the capabilities of our people to take what we might think of as resources, hardware and software and money and so forth, and transform them into something useful. Eventually, of course, we're going to specialize these capabilities in different aspects of a service lifecycle. Strategic planning, design, coordination of transition and change, operational support, and improvement activities. So this begs a fundamental question. What do we, in fact, mean when we use phrases like a service? What is a service anyway? Well, there's the formal definition that you can see on the slide here, that a service is a means of delivering value to customers, by facilitating outcomes customers want, enabling them to perform their work better, faster, more cost-effectively and get the results that they want without them having to own certain costs and risks. So let's think about what that actually means. So the service then, of course, isn't what we do. It's not our hardware, it's not our software, it's not our people, it's how using our capabilities we bring together the ability for organizations to have a higher degree of likelihood that they can get what they want, to facilitate their outcomes, to make it better or faster or cheaper, to be able to enhance the performance of their tasks, to be able to do it more consistently, or to be able to do it with a higher degree of speed and precision, or to be able to reduce the effects of certain constraints. Perhaps we can fully automate certain tasks that liberate their people to go do other things that are higher value. Regardless, we get one big thing the probability of what the business actually wants, the outcomes they actually want, goes up. And so that's what makes a service a service. It takes what businesses already want to do, which is to execute business processes to be able to support their goals, and enables it to be more likely that they're going to be able to do that successfully as a result of our IT services. 
there are a number of other core definitions that I want you to be familiar with as we work our way through the program here. When we talk about functions, largely we're talking about teams or groups of people. They're going to work together with certain tools to carry out certain processes or activities within processes. So, for example, a service desk might be responsible for carrying out certain activities in a process we might call incident management. Logging incidents, categorizing them, prioritizing them, maybe doing incident diagnosis or escalation procedures, for example. Processes themselves describe a set of activities designed to carry out an objective. So, for the example, in the incidents that I was just talking about, the incident management process is really about minimizing impact to customers when they have disruptions of service and help them, hopefully helping them getting up and running as quickly as possible. So that structured set of activities might include logging an incident, categorizing it, diagnosing it, escalating it, and ultimately resolving it. All right, so we're going to carry out that consistent set of activities again and again and again in the process with the goal of delivering on that objective. Now, any particular process typically defines a set of roles. In short, who's got what related to that particular processes? Who is responsible for certain activities to occur? What are the authorities that they have to actually exercise certain things? And keep in mind, in the case of the service management practices, we're talking about roles are not job roles. We're talking about roles within a particular process. So I may have a role we call first level support, that's the, where the job in an incident management process is to log an incident and begin to try to do diagnosis to see if we can figure out what it is. And I may have other teams play roles of second or third level support that are going to be managing escalated incidents. I may have a role called an incident manager whose job it is to oversee the activities of all the incident management teams. And I may even have a role called a process owner whose job it is to own incident management for our entire organization. So again, within any particular process, we're going to define different roles, and we may have different functional teams carrying out different roles and different processes. In this next lesson, I'm going to introduce you to the IT infrastructure library, talk a little bit about the idle books and how they provide benefits in trying to implement service management practices. So the idle books themselves describe a framework of practices for managing IT services, managing how we do strategy, managing how we do design, and so forth. This originated as a result of a series of activities in the United Kingdom starting in the 1980s, really looking at establishing with public and private sector inputs good practices for managing IT organizations. It's currently owned by the Cabinet Office in the UK government and describes five books that describe what we call the IT service life cycle. Service strategy, service design, service transition, service operation, and continual service improvement. There have been a number of different iterations of these books over time. The original version of Idle had literally 40 books in it. That was consolidated in 2001 to 7, in 2007 to 5, as part of what was called Idle version 3 at the time and now is referred to as Idle 2007, and then to the current version, Idle 2011, which maintains those five, but where we had a substantial refresh, especially in a couple of the books. Idle has currently, at this point, really dropped the whole idea of versioning in favor of having different releases, and they call the current release Idle 2011. The Idle framework by itself is what we refer to as a descriptive framework as opposed to a prescriptive one. Descriptive frameworks describe, in short, what to do, not necessarily how you want to go about doing it for the various aspects of the service lifecycle. The framework itself includes broad strategic processes, how to plan for demand, cost value, and to make strategic decisions about investments of IT resources and capabilities. We talk about tactical processes, planning for services, understanding customer requirements and provisioning and delivering the right baskets of services to enable those. And we talk about operational processes as well, how we go about the process of managing incidents and problems in our production environment, how we manage changes and deployment of new services and changes to existing services in the live space, how we monitor and manage infrastructure in a way to keep services up and running effectively. 
part of what we want to be able to do within each one of those process areas is to be able to align the work that needs to be done in terms of the activities that we're going to carry out within each of the processes and the various roles and responsibilities. Who exactly is going to go do what within each one of these processes to make sure the work gets done. It also provides a substantial amount of guidance around how to use technologies to support some of these activities. Managing configurations of services, process workflows across different aspects of tr strategic, tactical, and operational processes, and where to aim if efforts at task automation in a way that may liberate resources and improve overall quality of service. The end result and what we're really trying to achieve in using service management capabilities is the establishment of what we might call a service culture. Now, service culture sounds kind of ethereal, right? And so what it actually means is that we think less in terms of the technologies we manage and deploy and more in terms of the services and outcomes that we have to work together to deliver for our clients. So in many ways, working toward a service culture requires that we be cross-functional in our thinking, requires that we work in multiple process areas to support whole end-to-end -end services that deliver customer value. So let's take a simple example so you can think about how this would work. So let's take email, for example. Now, email is not a server running an application like Exchange or Note. Email requires a client front end, maybe Outlook or some equivalent, probably a desktop that that runs on, maybe network infrastructure to connect that to the local networking structure, uh, an, inform an ISP that's going to connect me through some type of WAN link to maybe some set of central servers and routers, and then storage infrastructure for how we're going to store the information and the data that we're actually using in our email application, as well as service desks and all the people responsible for managing all the aspects of that. Now, when I say as a customer, I want email, what I'm saying is, literally, I want to send and receive email. What I'm not saying is I want Exchange or I want Notes or I want some other email service. That may be part of it, but in order for us to actually deliver email, we have to think across all those pieces that make up a whole working end-to-end -end service. What do I need the desktop teams to do? What do I need the server teams to do? What do I need the application teams to do? What do I need a service desk to do to support a whole working service? And so service culture means thinking and working end-to-end. -end. And that's going to be an important part of the message we're going to talk about during this course. I want to have a coherent approach to how we do services, how we charter them, how we build them, how we deploy them, and how we operate and support them and drive improvements against them in a way that allows us to deliver and evolve those services to be able to meet changing customer needs. I want to be able to have good plans in place to operate services in production, to monitor normal healthy performance, and to get advance warning when I see services you know, moving away from where they're supposed to be. Ultimately, I want to be able to deliver a high level of consistency and predictability in the services that we have and to create the right communications and relationship between IT and the business at the strategic level, at tactical levels, and down at the user level, supporting them as well. So we're going to spend most of the rest of this orientation course talking about the service life cycle. But I want to take just a few moments to highlight the five idol books and how they work together to support services across the life cycle. So at the beginning, we think about this in terms of strategic planning. There's lots of things that we would like to do in theory as a service provider, but we can't do all the things that we want to because we're constrained. We don't have as much budget as we might want to have. We don't have as many resources and people as we might like to have. There are lots of things that we could do, but there are only a few things we can do. So the whole idea of service strategy is understanding which things we will do based on what our customers really need. What are the outcomes our customers are trying to deliver? And then based on that, what services should we be delivering to enable those outcomes to happen? Service design helps us understand customer requirements for services, how we design and develop or acquire the various assets to provision those services, and how we prepare to be able to manage, measure, integrate, and support those services for our live production space. 
Service transition helps us take new services or changes to existing services and move them from developed environments through testing and validation and successfully into production so the customers can get the benefits of those services and that we as service providers can manage risks appropriately both on the IT side and the customer side. Service operation is fundamentally about delivering on those services that we said that we were going to deliver and being able to provide appropriate support for them. And lastly, continual improvement is about driving improvements against all of those processes, all of those services that we're provisioning and delivering by looking for and identifying small iterative improvements to help drive improved value and being able to continually do this again and again and again over the long haul. One of the ways that IDLE provides good practices is by helping to describe a broad array of different process areas that are going to allow us to specifically focus on improving how we execute on strategic management, financials, design of services, transition and planning and change management, incident management, and other practices across the service lifecycle. In addition, it provides specific guidance on functional structures, especially for operations like our service desk, technical and operations and application management teams, and how we should use continual service improvement practices to drive improvements to each one of these processes. We're going to do a very high level description of these as we work our way through the courses. If you take a full foundations program or some of the idle intermediate programs, you can obviously learn a great deal of additional detail about how these processes work and how to implement them effectively in your organization. So when we look at services and how idle helps us manage services across the life cycle, it's helpful to think about this in two broad strokes how we plan and design services, and how we operate services in the environment. And so when we think about the role of service strategy and service design, it's largely about having a managed approach to making decisions about which services we're actually going to commit to deliver, having a coherent process for how those decisions get made and chartered, and then having good ways to design services, whether we build or buy, how we coordinate across different project teams to ensure that we can actually provision and deliver services effectively. Then from an operations standpoint, my goal is to be able to take that service capability and bring it to life in the operational environment by good, using good transition planning and execution, by using good processes and functional support capabilities in operations, and then by using improvement capabilities to drive ongoing improvements to that service so we can maintain the service value to the customer. Now let's take a few minutes to look at service strategy and its role in the overall service lifecycle. If you think about why we do strategies at all, of course, it's because we don't know what we don't know, right? So we want to be able to make decisions, allocate resources, and lead organizations even though we don't always have perfect information about the things that we want to do. Likewise, there's always more things that we would like to do than we can because we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough budget, we don't have enough time to do everything. So we have to prioritize those things appropriately. So the whole idea behind service strategy as a portion of the life cycle is I want to be able to look at all the things that we do as a service management practice, how we design services, how we transition them, how we operate them, how we improve them, even how we do strategic planning, in terms of the resources and commitments we make. We only have so many people. We only have so much budget. How and where am I going to invest that? And how do I do that in a way that really does two key things? Optimizes the amount of value that we can create for our customers and allows us to capture enough value to sustain ourselves as a service provider. Let's take a look at how this plays out. So service strategy and a portion of its life cycle is really about creating models to be able to effectively use strategies to plan how we're going to provision and deliver services in support of service value. Remember, in the strategic level, we probably are working with very imperfect information. So I want to understand something about what our customers are looking for, how many users are in need of different kinds of services, what it would cost us to provision and deliver those services, and then given all the things that we could do, how and who gets to make decisions about what we actually are going to commit to do in order to be able to create the right basket of services to support our customers. 
The way that we're going to do strategy is through the implementation and use of five key processes. And we'll talk about these in a little bit of detail. Strategy management, by and large, is about setting strategic goals, objectives, mission, and vision for us as a service provider organization. What is our objective as a service provider? If we're an internal service provider, that's probably a pretty easy question. It's to support our internal customers, our various business units who use our services. If you're an external service provider, that's a bigger question. What exactly is the basket of services that you offer and who are you offering them to? What market spaces are you trying to serve and why would customers want to buy particular baskets of services from us? So we want to be able to use a process like strategy management to figure out in broadest, in broadest terms what in fact our strategy is for being an effective service provider, the customers that we want to serve. Service portfolio management helps us manage investments and commitments across the life cycle. I only have so many people. I only have so much budget. I only have so many licenses of various software and what have you. Each of those represents an investment or a commitment of some kind. And once I've invested it in one thing, it's not available to me to invest in something else. So I want to be able to think about investing my resources in a way that optimizes the amount of value I can create as a service provider. Financial management for IT services, as the name implies, really helps us think about finance in a service view. For a particular end-to-end -end service, what is the cost of provisioning that service? What is the value that service creates for our customer? And how do we use that to produce and underpin business cases so that we can make good decisions about investments? Demand management helps us understand different demand from different customers. How many people will use this service and how exactly do they use that service? And ultimately, what are the implications for how we plan performance and capacity and how that's going to affect our financial models? Lastly, the business relationship management process is really focused on customers and customer satisfaction. What are the customer outcomes that the customers want? And what services could we provision or deliver that would enable those outcomes to be achieved? How do we maintain good customer relationships through the service life cycle, from strategy through improvement? So when you consider the broad purpose, goals, and objectives of strategy, it's really to take all the things we do in service management, how we support services, how we manage change, how we design them, and even how we do strategy, and use it in a way that fundamentally creates strategic value for the customers that we use. So if you're supporting a particular customer, that customer has goals and objectives they're trying to achieve. They have organizational missions and visions they're trying to achieve. If we do this the right way, service management really is making a pretty profound claim that by doing these practices, we're actually contributing to the likelihood that the organization is going to meet its mission. So how does that actually work? We want to be able to define the services that we offer and who we're offering those services to. What is it about our services that's different than other alternatives? How does this create value for our customers? How do we as service providers capture value? If I'm an external service provider, that's probably through payments and ultimately through making money and being able to sustain myself as a business. If I'm an internal service provider, it's probably through funding and some level of goodwill for both of those. How do we build business cases that are going to allow us to make decisions about different strategic investments? At any point along the way, there might be 50 great things I'd love to do, but I only have resources for four or five of them. How do I make those decisions? And who makes those decisions? Ultimately, strategy helps us give vis visibility and control of the money, both in terms of the costs of provisioning services and especially in terms of the value that creates for customers. This also allows us to understand and look at different levels of service quality, to be able to evaluate different service alternatives, and ultimately to make good allocation decisions about how we invest resources to deliver benefits for customers. So if we look at this holistically, the intent of strategy is really to create a framework for strategic decision making. Understanding cost value, understanding demand, understanding what our customers really want from us, and then making effective decisions in support of our overall strategy on how and what we're going to provision and to whom. So this, of course, begins backward from the business. 
your business organization, again, have their own goals and objectives that they're trying to support, and they have their own business processes that they're going to use to carry out their day-to-day -day activities for sales, for marketing, for operations, for just performing the work of your organization. So if you think about then the role of an IT service portfolio, it's to invest resources in a way that makes their jobs work more effectively. How do I make those business processes work better, faster, and make it more likely they're going to be able to work correctly and deliver the results that are intended? And so we're really thinking in terms of investment. How do I invest in new services, in changes to existing services, in operational support of services I have in production, in identifying improvement opportunities for my processes and services to enable us to continue to deliver good quality to our business customers. So when we look at the value associated with doing service strategy, it begins with understanding the customer's value of doing their work. Customers have their own objectives and goals. And what they're looking for us to be able to do is to help facilitate them getting their outcomes that they're intending to try to get. So the customer's perceptions of quality are largely driven by their expectations and how well the service actually facilitates getting to the outcomes. So notice this is a pretty big shift for most IT organizations, away from really being efficient in how we utilize resources, which is sort of an important thing to do, to how well we actually facilitate and act as a business enabler. Are we in fact creating the outcomes customers want? Because in truth, of course, customers really don't want IT. They want to be able to perform their work quickly and efficiently, and IT is just a means to that. Likewise, most customers don't really want to buy training. They want to buy things like knowledge and skills and perhaps certification and credentials. And so training is, again, a means, not an end. So we use training programs like this to create awareness, to teach you core ideas, but it's the knowledge that you want, not the training per se. And so part of what we want to be able to do as a strategic provider is to think about the outcomes our customers are actually looking to achieve and to make sure that the services that we provision and deliver actually facilitate those outcomes and that we continue to evolve the services in a way that helps them sustain their value as the business environment changes rapidly over time due to things that are happening inside the organization and things that are happening in the larger world based on economic conditions or changes in legal and regulatory compliance or just competitive threats. There are five core processes within service strategy. The first of these is strategy management for IT services. And essentially what this describes is how we as a service provider will enable our organization to achieve its outcomes. Now, for an internal service provider, this is a really easy conversation because we are part of that organization. Your organization has its own mission, has its vision. Your organization has broad business goals and objectives. And so strategy management for an internal service provider is how do I pull my weight and row the boat in a way that's going to enable me to support meeting the organization's mission and vision. If you're an external service provider, I want to make sure that we understand as a service provider what our broad goals and objectives are in being able to support different baskets of customers with different baskets of services in a way that enables us to be able to sustain ourselves as a service provider to hopefully be successful in the provisioning and the delivery of our services and to drive improvements in the outcomes that our customers reach as well. Service portfolio management is really looking at investments. So if you think about what a portfolio manager hopefully does with your money, they invest it and the hope is that they're going to manage risks and deliver returns. And by and large, that's really what we're looking for from service portfolio management too. I have people, I have budget, I have hardware and software, I have some process and some management skills and some knowledge. How are we going to invest those? And ultimately, how do we then produce services that deliver value to customers with them? And so service portfolio management kind of goes beyond what we might think of as part of a PMO for project management to not just look at the pipeline of new services, but to look at all the money being spent in operations on existing services in our service catalog and to be able to identify potential services that we can retire because they're no longer needed that might liberate resources to go be used for something that's higher value. 
The financial management for IT services process helps us understand BAC, budgeting, accounting, and charging. How much is it going to cost us to provision and deliver a service? How much does it actually cost when we go actually do it? And then how do we do cost recovery or chargeback? And again, it's really interested in focusing not just on the cost side of the equation, but how effectively do we then deliver value for customers? What is the value associated with the services that we provision and deliver? And that that really underpins the whole idea of a business case. So I want to look not just at the cost of service provisioning, but the value of it. Demand management really looks at two key ideas. Patterns of use or patterns of business activity. How will people and how do people use services? And the whole idea of a user profile. Are there different groups of users that use services in a particular way? And so eventually, of course, when I design a service, I have to know, and pardon me for the informality here, how all and who all is going to use this service? And how do I make good decisions about how we provision the right amount of service to the right customers so they can perform? Eventually, that's something that we're going to have to make formalized when we do capacity planning for the service and design. But in order to make the business case, I have to understand the number of people who are going to be using services and in what ways they're going to be using the services so we can make predictive models about how much hardware, how much software, how much support resource we're going to need to actually go provision that service. Lastly, business relationship management, as the name implies, is really focused on establishing and maintaining an ongoing business relationship with the customers we serve understanding customers' outcomes and how different things drive changes in the customer's needs over time, and how we align services in a way that creates customer satisfaction and maintains proper alignment between what we're doing as an IT organization and what our customers are getting as services. So there's a strategy part of this and being able to elicit and understand potential customer needs, but there's also a role to be played in facilitating communications during design, during transition, support during operations, and even working collaboratively to to identify potential opportunities for service improvements. When we look at some of the overarching principles that really drive service strategy, it really begins with this whole notion of creating value, identifying and documenting and investing your service assets, looking at different service provider models, and then looking at how we envision our investments in terms of a service portfolio and use processes like service portfolio management to make decisions about how we're going to invest those resources. Let's take a look at each one of these now. In many organizations, there is a persistent gap between the quality of service that we think we're providing as IT organizations and the quality of services our customers perceive that we're providing to them. The reason this is so persistent is because we're focused on producing hardware, software, and various technical support capabilities. And the challenge from the customer's perspective is that's not really what they want. What the customer really wants to be able to do is perform their work and to be able to do it reasonably efficiently and effectively and for our IT stuff, whatever that is, to facilitate that. And so if we really want to be able to bridge that gap, we have to put on a different headset and start thinking about this from the customer's point of view. What are the outcomes our customers are trying to achieve? What are the business process and process workflows they're using to carry out their work? And how exactly is it that my service would create what we'll call service utility for them? How does this enable them to perform their work better, faster, more cost effectively than they might be able to otherwise? So the idle speak for this is what we call fit for purpose. Is the service actually fit for the purpose it's designed for? So if the service is designed to help me create and print invoices, how well does it actually help me do that? Does it enable me to be able to create and print invoices without having to manage my own software or manage my own servers or store and facilitate and back up the data, those kinds of things? The other key things I have to think about is what we might call the services warranty. How reliable is the service? Is the service available when I need it to be available? Is there enough of it? Does it perform at the appropriate level so that I can perform my work reliably and effectively? If there were a disaster, could we effectively recover the service and how quickly? 
and how secure is the information in the service? Can I use this service for mission critical information for, with very sensitive data? So when we think about the value of the service, the value really then gets driven into the utility of the service and the warranty of the service. So when you start thinking about how we create services, one of the things that we have to think about is creating enough utility and enough warranty that we're going to be able to make a compelling argument that somebody ought to use our service to be able to perform their work. Now there are many examples in the general world of services that are unbalanced in some fundamental way. So for example, I have a little girl and she was watching TV one day and in particular was watching something on one of the shopping networks on the television. And at the time, the shopping network was selling something to make fried onions. Now, I'm sure that the thing made particularly good fried onions because most of those companies have pretty low margins and so returns of products don't really work very well in their business model. So I reasonably have a high degree of confidence that that service has probably got pretty good warranty. It's probably going to make pretty good fried onions. There's just one small problem. I don't want to make a fried onion. Never have, never will. So for me, this is particularly a low utility item. It's not going to enable me to do anything I particularly want to do. So as a result, we may have a service that has a very high degree of warranty, but it doesn't really do anything I want, so it's not really delivering a lot of value. This can go the other way too. I had a neighbor growing up who had a convertible and had a, a foreign made convertible he just loved. He built his own, art, his own garage for it. He also had a car cover for it. It sat in the garage basically all week long. On Saturday mornings, he'd take the cover off, roll the car out of the garage, down the driveway, park it next to his house, and take out his paper and his coffee and sit in his open convertible and read the paper and drink his coffee. There was just one thing I never actually got to see him do with that car and that was to drive it any place because the car was notoriously unreliable and he took it out three times and each time it came back on a tow truck. So while the car had a great deal of perceived utility for him, it didn't have any meaningful warranty. It wasn't a usable car. So in order to deliver a functional service, I have to get up in this green zone where I have enough of both that I have a service that the customer is going to be willing to use. And then I have some ability to differentiate my service if I choose. Do I want to offer extra capabilities and features? Offer a facility that makes it a really easy service to use? That might drive overall improvements in the utility of that service. Do I want to be a specialist in security? or in providing a high degree of performance or a high degree of availability of my service. That might allow me to differentiate my service based on warranty. But ultimately, in order for the service to be valuable to the customer, it's got to have the right combination of both. It has to be fit for the use it's designed for, has to have that utility, and it has to be fit for use. It has to be able to be reliably used again and again and again when we want to be able to go deliver that service. Now in order to be able to reliably deliver services, I want to be able to invest what we're going to call our resources and our capabilities. Now to envision what we really mean when we say resources, envision a pile of stuff on the floor. Okay, this stuff could include some hardware, some software, some of those big blocks of money like you get out of the bank vault, uh, maybe some people. It's a bunch of potential energy I can bring to bear to potentially deliver certain aspects of services. And then capabilities are what we do to transform that stuff into services. We can manage it. We can use good organization and functional structures. We can use effective processes. We can use the knowledge, skills, and expertise of our people to invest those services in a way that creates benefits for the customer. So the actual moral to the story here is really straightforward. I have to figure out what combination of resources and capabilities to invest in which services so I can create the needs and support the customers that I have. The ironic part of this, and the part that really makes this strategic, is frankly it's really not about our capabilities and resources anyway. Because don't all customer organizations have their own resources and capabilities? 
And so what we're really looking to do is to create a basket of services that helps our customer organizations maximize the use of their resources and capabilities in delivering and supporting value for their customers. Now when we're looking strategically at how we provision and deliver services to customers, we can take different structures in how we provide services back. We can use what Idle calls a Type 1 model, which is essentially embedded at a business unit level. Obviously the benefits there, the closer you are to the business, the better visibility you have to the business processes, the more likely it is that you're going to deliver good services that are aligned to those. But you lose a lot of economies of scale, especially if you have lots and lots of replicative services across your organization. In a Type 2 model, perhaps you're looking at a shared services opportunity where I may have a number of different business units and I have kind of a corporate shared services unit that provides services across those different business organizations. That's going to help me gain some economies of scale, but I'm at some risk that I'm not in fact going to deliver exactly the right kinds of services to the different business units that need it. In a Type 3 model, perhaps instead of using internal services, I'm going to use an external service provider to provision that service. Again, I'm trying to take advantage of economies of scale to drive down costs, but the, the flip side, of course, is now I'm really far away from the individual needs of a business organization, and the odds are reasonably good that there's probably going to be some gaps between the service I get from the third-party provider and the actual needs of a particular business unit. So on your screen here, you see this depiction of a service portfolio. And again, the size of the circles tell you something about the size of the investment that's being made in that particular portion of the life cycle. Now, the portfolio itself has three main parts. The pipeline, services that are coming. The catalog, stuff that we have now. And retired services, things that maybe we used to have, but we're going to retire so we can liberate some resources to go reinvest in something else. So if you think about service portfolio management, first and foremost, I want to be able to define this for my organization. How much resource is being spent in designing new services, transitioning them out of development into production? How much of my investment is going into keeping the lights on in operation, being able to identify and maintain and support services? Are there ways for me to gain efficiencies so that I can drive up the amount of money I can invest in new capabilities and services and hopefully at least sustain, if not drive down, the costs of having to operate services in production. And so what we want to be able to use portfolio management to do, in short, is to maximize the value of this. When I make these investments and commitments, what do we get? And what does a customer get as, as, a, as a consumer of that service? Are we making the right investments to enable the outcomes our customers may want? So the idea behind service portfolio management as a process is really to look at service management in two contexts. Number one, from an IT service management perspective, what resources and commitments are we investing in being able to manage strategic planning, design, transition, operate and support services, and use good consistent processes to deliver better quality. From the business's perspective, their interest is largely in value for money. When they give us money as a service provider, whether it's through funding or paying for contracts with third parties, they're trying to get value for that investment. Are we delivering the right capabilities in the right way that facilitate the outcomes that that customer wants? And so service portfolio management as a process uses a particular methodology, defining the portfolio, defining things like my business cases for future potential options related to the portfolio, doing some analysis. What are the relative cost benefits of doing different kinds of things? Where are some of my restrictor plates or constraints that may prevent me from making certain choices? What exactly are the approval decisions and who makes those decisions about what choices we're actually going to make and which services we're actually going to commit to deliver? and then ultimately chartering those choices, communicating the decision and allocating resources appropriately, essentially where strategy at this point ends and design begins.